joking. Uh, it's a good day. Uh, the Longhorns played last night for the first time this season, and I think we did well. If I kept up to date with the scores, I didn't watch the game, but I saw some guys uh, being very proud um, on their burnt, about their burnt orange clothing and, and caps. Uh, if you're not a Texas fan, um, I hope your team did well. I hope your team did okay. That, that'll be more honest. Um, wonderful. Um, I want to start off this morning with a scripture, Proverbs 4, verse 23. It says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. It's interesting, he, uh, this, is, this is Solomon that writes that this, probably the wisest man of his time, one of the wisest guys probably that ever lived. God gave him wisdom. He writes this, um, and it's inter- interesting that he says, everything you do flows from it. He doesn't say, well, sort of guard your heart. There's some importance to it. You know, there's, there's this sort of corner of your life which might be influenced by it, or there's this little thing that you might hide that will be influenced by it. He says, God, your heart, because everything flows from it. Your whole life is determined by the condition of your heart. Your life is determined by what's happening in your heart, not your physical heart. You know, your physical heart, well, if your physical heart is giving problems, you're probably going to, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna, your life is going to be influenced as well. But Solomon here is speaking about um, what happens in your life, your emotions, your center. Now, Daniel Goleman um, was a guy that first started theorizing about IQ not being the most important thing in life. And around about the late 70s, early 80s, um, most people believe your success in life is primarily determined by your IQ. And Daniel started asking the question, okay, if that is true, then why are there so many extremely clever and academic, talented people that's just struggling at life? And he started to do some research. um, And in his book, um, Emotional Intelligence, He found after years of study that only about 20% um, of your success in life is determined by your IQ. The rest of it is determined by your EQ, your emotional intelligence, your ability to find out and figure out what is happening in your heart deal with that accurately, and then respond to people and to the world. That is more determining to whether we are successful in life than what our IQ or our uh, intelligence is. Now, in my development, when I was a young boy, there's certain things that I learned in school, and I'm pretty sure you'd have a similar experience. Uh, the first thing they taught me in school was some you know, motor uh, motor skills. They, they gave me some clay and they said, play, you know, go make a zebra. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm making a zebra. Um, they always send me back to make the zebra again and again and again. So I, I don't think I was very good at making a zebra. I'm like, it has a head, it has four legs, it's a zebra. And, uh, but apparently that wasn't good enough and I had to continually go. And they gave me a ball. I had to play with a ball. I had interaction. They, they, they put me in a, um, in a sand pit and I played with the sand. I, they, they, they taught me some, some skills just with my hands. I'm, I'm sure most of you learned that as you grow up. It's part of the way that we develop. Then also what they did, they, they spent a lot of time investing into my logic. They said one plus one is two. And it took me a while to get there, but eventually I learned that the answer is not three, it is actually two, and I figured out how it works and why one plus one is two, and there's whole subject throughout your schooling years, maths and science, that's just devoted to developing your logic. They also invested some time in me um, with regards to information, which I think was a waste, because I can just say, say, okay, Google, tell me this and this and this, and it just gives me the answer. But when I, when, I, when I was growing up, I didn't have Google. I had a big handbook with history, and I learned all about the Second World War um, and, 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 and some facts with regards to that. I learned that the earth is round 
even though flat earthers will dispute that, I still believe the earth is round. And how I can believe it's round. They, 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 the one thing I didn't learn, and I'm sure you guys learned it over here, is that Texas is the center of the universe. Okay, I missed that. They never taught that to me. But uh, being here, I can see that was a major lack in my upbringing. I should have learned that earlier, earlier in life. They also spent some time just investing into my communication skills. So I learned languages. I learned Afrikaans as a first language, English as probably a seventh or eighth language, the way that I speak it, um, and then some Sutu, which is one of the local um, languages in South Africa. Not that I can speak a lot, a lot, a lot of it, but I, I, at some stage I could at least understand it. And they taught me how to, how to write in these languages, how to communicate, how to speak. And that is the, pretty much, if I have to sum up what I got taught when I was in school, that was it. That was what I was taught. And years and years and years went into developing these skills, which most of it would be considered IQ. But you know what received almost no attention? My emotions, my feelings, and how I deal with that. In fact, probably the opposite. When I grew up and something didn't make sense and I couldn't figure out why I was feeling like I was feeling, most people around me would just say, JP, you're a man. Suck it up. Okay? And I know you, the ladies here might say, well, what about us? My experience is you're a lady, you can cry for 10 minutes, and then you need to suck it up. So it's basically <laughs> the same thing, Okay? Development never, our, our development as young people, very few of us learned how to deal with this. Um, but the thing is, life happens. And when life happens, stuff happens. We get disappointed, we fail, people hurt us, um, there, there's people that just abandon us. There's a bunch of stuff in life happening with us. And we were never taught how to deal with that and how to respond to that and how to work through that. Is it just me or do you guys agree? That happens. And Solomon says, guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart. And my experience of this is everything that I was taught is opposite. It's just suck it up. Don't care about your heart. Just suck it up. Move on. The problem is that because of the way that we were taught of, about dealing with, with stuff, we, we, we oftentimes have deep hurt and scars and issues within ourselves that we never deal with. We just suppress it, layer upon layer upon layer. We just suppress this stuff in our heart. And some people, I don't know, some people are, are brilliant with, with EQ. They just have a knack for it, and they figure out how to do it on their own. But, but for most of us, probably me included, well, not probably, me included, <laughs> there's some stuff that I learn and is still learning and are still learning. Sorry, once again, there my seventh language comes in. And still is our learning. Is that what you... I still are, am learning. Yes. Okay. The thing is, because... And Solomon was wise, and I agree with him. Because this influences everything. Oftentimes, subconsciously, it influences the way that we feel which influences the way that we think. This influences the way that we act. And that influences the way that we relate with other people. All of your life, all of your relationships are influenced by what's going on in your heart. And not just the relationship with the guy sitting next to you or your family members co-workers at work. I want to tell you there's two extra relationships, two extra relationships that severely impacted by what's going on in your heart. And the first one is your relationship with yourself. And the second one is your relationship with God. 
It's impacted by what's going on in your heart. It determines everything. And um, we're busy, Yuri mentioned, we're busy with a series called Planted, Flourishing in Life. And I want to tell you this is probably one of the main reasons why a lot of us are struggling to flourish. And there is a big chance that you are not living the life that God intended for you because of this. And this makes this sermon so important. And I'm not preaching at you guys. I promise you, I think I'm preaching at myself. The more I prepared for this message, the more I realized, oh my goodness, Lord, you're speaking to me. And I don't like it. Um, but we need to deal with this. We need to speak about it. In Afrikaans, we've got a word. We call it chochas. Okay? Can you repeat that after me? Chochas. Okay? Now, chochas is, there's not really a word in English that, 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 that is really similar, but it's sort of creepy, crawly insects that hides in dark places. You know, like your cockroaches and centipedes, you know, those, those type of insects that you like. Oh, no, that's bad. You don't want to go there. So, chochas is the word you, we use for that. And I want to tell you, there's a saying in Afrikaans um, that oftentimes we would say, there's a chocha. Chochas is more than one. Chocha is one. There's a chocha in your heart. Or there's chochas in your heart. And I'm trusting this morning that God would take the lid of the dark places in our heart and reveal to us the chochas that's hiding there and help us to clear that out and clean that out. And during the week as I was preparing, I was praying for you guys. I don't know all of you by name, but some of you I do know by name and I prayed for you. Some of you by name. And trusting that God would come and show you. And I pray this morning, please guys, let's not be offended by what, what I'm saying. I'm really not trying to offend anyone, but I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit would come and convict us with regards to this. Now, in, in preparation, obviously, if you prepare for a message, um, you spend some time with God, you spend some time delving into the Word, but you also spend some time just reading up what other guys says about the specific topic. And the, the guy that I found most helpful in just helping me to shape my thinking with regards to this um, was a guy called Andy Stanley. You've probably heard of him. Um, and he wrote a book called Enemies of the Heart, and in it, um, he mentions the four enemies of our heart, the four enemies that we face. And um, I'm using just the outline that Andy Stanley was using in his book, um, but I want to tell you there's so much more, and go and read the book, it's, it's a great resource, but there's so much more that I feel that God was, was giving to me in this morning. Um, I'm, I'm trusting that it won't be Andy Stanley that speaks to us and just, you know, the, the sort of the, the skeleton for this message, that it won't be JP that's speaking to you, but I trust this morning that the Holy Spirit would come and speak to you with regards to this. I want to ask you this morning not to be offended, but allow the Holy Spirit to come and speak to your heart, um, to come and convict you with regards to these things. And um, I think relationships and how we act with other people and feel and think about other people is so important and so key. I don't believe there's a person in this room whom this, who, who can say this morning, this message is not for me. I believe this is for you. Okay. So are you guys ready? Yeah. Are you ready for God to speak to you? Thank you, Zach. I got a huge thumbs up there at the back. Uh, <laughs> I thought for a moment you wanted to ask a question, um, but I, thought, I, I saw it was that, that, that finger. Okay. Let's dive in. So Jesus was betrayed by two of his disciples shortly before his death. First one, Judas. You know about that? So he sold Jesus out, and he told the Roman soldiers who Jesus was. They paid him money for that. Um, so Jesus was betrayed. But the second person that betrayed Jesus just before his death was Peter. 
okay? And uh, Peter made a promise, Lord, I'm never going to deny you. I'm, it was almost like he was sort of acknowledging to Jesus, I'm your biggest fan. I'm the closest to you. I love you the most. There's no way I'm going to betray you or ever walk away from you. And shortly before Jesus' death, just after they arrested him, three times in a row, uh, Peter betrays Jesus, says, I don't know him. I have no idea who that is. So you have these two guys that are betraying Jesus, and I can imagine that both of them felt guilty. And that's the first enemy of our heart, is guilt. Now, guilt thrives from this feeling that says, I owe you. Guilt lies to you, and it says, you did something wrong. You owe someone else. And oftentimes, we fall for that lie, hook, line, and sinker. And how we deal with this determines a lot. I mean, if if you just look at Judas and Peter, and from that moment of betrayal, um, where their lives led, it is two completely different paths. I mean, you can can believe and, 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 and hold on to that guilt in your life, but that didn't work out well for Judas. He ended up hanging himself in the field that his money bought. It wasn't a good end result, holding on to the guilt. Peter dealt with it somewhat differently. And the exact interaction between him and Jesus, um, there's there's some written about it, but not everything is there. But it's obvious if you see Peter, it seems that he went to Jesus. He didn't run away from Jesus. He went to Jesus. He engaged Jesus. And he ended up being the central figure in the very first church in Jerusalem. Well, the very first church in the world. How you deal with guilt is so important. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not the guy next to you. Not not only your husband or only your wife. All have sinned, okay? I know some of us were like, yes, my my wife sins a lot, you know, or my husband sins a lot. Uh, Yes, they do. But you do too. You sin just as much. And the reality is oftentimes when we speak about sin, we we reference things way in our past, at least for me. Yes, I sinned. You know, three years ago, this and this and this this happened. It's like, no, no, no. JP sinned yesterday. In fact, I think JP sinned this morning. If you were wondering whether you sinned this morning, ask your your spouse. They'll they'll tell you. It's probably this morning. We all sin. We're all guilty. You and me alike, we all mess up. How we deal with it is so important. James 5 verse 16 says, make this your common practice. I love those words. Make this your your common practice. Yuri spoke last week about building in good habits into our lives. This is speaking about this. Make it a common practice. Make it a habit in your life, okay? So not just do it once and then you can forget about it. He says make it common practice. When you're together, it should be so common that it's sort of just practice. He says make this common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together Whole and healed. Confess your sins. And that is the way that I believe we address this first enemy of our heart. The remedy for the enemy is confessing. Confess. That word confess means to acknowledge completely. So that means looking back at all the facts and acknowledging or agreeing with your wrongdoing. Confess your sins. Agree to what you have done wrong. Don't hide it. Don't try to talk around it, giving excuses. I know I'm good at that. I sort of acknowledge that I did something wrong, but I try to make excuses for why I did it wrong, you know? Acknowledge it. Confess it. Don't talk around it. Fully agree to it. And then the second remedy for this heart condition is living free. Live free. The reality is we are guilty. And you can confess it, but you can live in that guilt, continue to live in that guilt. Romans 8 verse 1 to 2 says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. 
And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit, listen to this, has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Guys, this is the best news ever. In fact, it's called the gospel. (laughs) The fact that you don't have to live in your sin and live with guilt the whole time, Jesus freed you. You don't have to live under that. So confess your sin and live in the freedom that God gives. Now, if you mess up towards someone, you can't force that person to make right with you but you can take ownership from your side, okay? It might be after you confess and after you live free and realize that God has forgiven you, that that person might still hold something against you. And you can't can't take ownership for that, but you can take ownership for what goes on in your heart. And I want to encourage us to do that. There's a friend of mine, um, he's probably just over 40, been married for about, 20 years, uh, he's got two kids, and um, him and his wife, beautiful couple, lovely couple, um, and in the church that I was, was with him in, in, in South Africa, um, he, he was one of the, the, the upcoming leaders, and he was, he was starting, him and his, and his wife just said yes to taking one of the, our, our church's life groups, um, and I thought they were going to be brilliant with it. They were just so relational, so loving, so kind, so full of Jesus. And um, I, I grabbed a beer with him one, one evening, and we were sitting, and the next moment he told me, JP, I'm struggling with suicidal thoughts. And I'm like, what? You don't, you don't look like that at all. And, and, and I thought I, I was sort of shocked at first just about his confession, about what he's struggling with in his heart. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to have to delve deeper. And I was starting to think of questions that I can ask to sort of see if I can find out exactly what's the reason but he didn't take one question. <laughs> he was ready to, to, to spill the beans and to just come out with it. And it turned out we were three guys that he decided to go and speak to, and I was one of the three guys. And about 20 years earlier, about a year into their marriage, he cheated on his wife. He had an affair for a few months. He and his wife, uh, he stopped it. He and his wife got saved about a year later, and they sold out their lives to Christ. They, they followed Jesus. Um, and so they, they, they walked together for about 19, 20 years after that, but he never told his wife about what happened there. And that guilt was just eating him up inside. And the more that he began to minister and began to discover his gifts in God, the more this guilt just ate him up inside saying, no, 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 I can't. I still have this thing. And I want to tell you, it took that guy probably about two months of prayer and building up enough courage to go and speak to his wife about that. And by the grace of God, she forgave him. She, she forgave him in much less than two months. <laughs> it probably could have gone differently. There's a big chance that it might have gone differently. But I want to tell you the release that he experienced after that was massive. And I remember probably about a year after that, I sat down and I had another beer with him. Um, he loves beer. He's like Wagner. So, um, um, so I, I oftentimes have coffee with people, and then there's certain people, you know, you grab a beer with them. Anyway, so I, I had another beer with him, and I, I asked him, listen, John, his name is not John. Um, listen, John, um, how's it going with that? And he's like, oh, no, it's going great. In fact, I sort of forgot about it. And that guilt has left his life to such a degree that he said for a few months before that, he hasn't even thought about it until I brought it up again. It wasn't an issue in his heart anymore. You see, guilt eats you up from inside. And we need to deal with that. If there's something in your life that you did against someone else, or even against God, or even maybe against yourself, deal with it. Confess that sin ask for forgiveness, live in the freedom that God gives. Let's move on to the second enemy, Moses and Joshua, two great guys, two great leaders of Israel. And we read in Exodus, we read the story about Moses going up to the mountain Um, and and, and speaking to God, and God gave him the law, the Ten Commandments. Now, if you go and read the story, it's sort of in the side notes of the story, but he wasn't alone. Joshua was with him on the mountaintop. 
Um, so Moses and Joshua is on the mountain. They have this great experience with God. They're interceding for the nation that's in the valley below, the Israelites. They're speaking to God. God is giving them the law. And then when they come down, they hear this from the bottom. And they start asking, what is that? Is it, is it a shout of war? Did we miss a war? And then Moses realizes, no, this is not the shout of war. And uh, you might know the story, but the Israelites were, were, were getting frustrated with having to wait for God for a few days. So they built themselves a golden calf, and they started worshiping this golden calf. And um, you can imagine that both Moses and Joshua at that stage might have felt, what the heck are you guys doing? I can imagine there was some, some just livid thoughts with regards to the Israelites and uh, these people that they were trying to serve that just completely turned their back on God and disregarded what Moses and Joshua did for them. Moses is in fact, at that very moment, he's so upset that he takes these tablets that God gave him of stone, heavy tablets that God wrote with his own finger, a supernatural writing of the law on tablets. He's so angry with the people that he takes these tablets. I assume they were heavier. So I, 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 I always imagine him doing it one at a time. And I, I don't think Moses was a weightlifter. So it was probably just, hit, you know, it wasn't like, yeah, I'll throw it down like that. But he threw down the tablets and they broke into pieces. He was so angry with them. And that's the second enemy in our hearts, is anger that he broke the tablets that God gave him. <laughs> Later on, God said, okay, Moses, you can come up again. This time, I'm going to give them to you again, but I'm not writing them. You're writing them. So I see poor old Moses there with his chisel. Please, God, just one finger. Just You do, you do number three. I'll do number four again. <laughs> See, this enemy thrives on this feeling of, you owe me. You did something against me. Loves that. It drives that wedge into your heart. But how, once again, how we deal with that anger determines so much. It's interesting, a few chapters, well, not, not in Exodus, in, in, I think it's in Leviticus, we read the story um, or numbers, I'm not, I'm not sure. But we read the story later on where, where the, 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 the Jews are, are, are thirsty and they want to drink water. They, they ask Moses, and God tells Moses, okay, speak to the rock and uh, I'll give you water. What does Moses do? He takes his staff and he hits the rock. And, and God tells him after that, he says, because you did this, you will not enter the promised land. And I always thought, wow, that's, that's harsh of God. That's really harsh. I mean, I could never understand it. But looking at the anger in Moses' heart, if, if, if I'm angry, I would be inclined to hit something as well instead of speaking to it. I mean, if you're angry, I know for me, when I'm angry, I want to I wanna grab something, you know, ah, myself, and I'm just going to, you know, throw it or smash it. I want to I wanna hit something. And you can imagine that that was probably the reason why Moses ended up hitting that rock instead, rock instead of speaking to that rock. And I'm wondering, the Bible is not explicit about that, but I'm wondering whether the reason why he did not enter into the promised land is perhaps because there was anger in his heart towards the Israelites that he never dealt with. Now we look at Joshua. He was with Moses on the mountaintop. He experienced what Moses experienced. There was probably a feeling of anger as well, but we see none of these symptoms in Joshua's heart. Obviously, that young man dealed with it. And 40 years later, he is the guy that's leading the Israelites into the promised land. Willem, can you quickly join me? Yuri has an example when he speaks about about this. Um, and uh, I've got a little paper made by Elonwe. Once again, Elonwe, if you're watching this video later, thank you. It says, you owe me. But unforgiveness, oftentimes what we do is we have this, you did something against me. Okay? So I'm going to, this, this, this guilt, you owe me, I'm going to keep it against you. 
okay? And we keep it against another person. And we think by keeping it against them that we control them. But that is not what happens oftentimes. Um, you see, if I want to keep it against him, I'm not in control. He, he's in control. I, I, I've, I've got to follow him wherever he goes. I can't. I want to go there, but I can't. And sometimes it's really hard to keep whatever someone did against them, but we do. We, we keep it against them. Okay, thank you, Willem. You can just, you can just stand there for a while. Th- thank you. And we, 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 we spend so much time keeping whatever someone did against us, against them, that we're not free. Listen to this. Ephesians 4, verse 26 to 27 says, And don't sin by letting anger control you. We often think that anger is our only measure of control in that situation, so we hold, hold on to it. But actually, anger controls us. I'm at the mercy of this anger and this person against whom the anger is. And Willem knows nothing about it. He's just going for a, a, you know, sort of Sunday morning walk. He's got no idea. Anger tends to control us. And the remedy for the enemy called anger is forgiveness. We need to forgive. We need to forgive. Now, interesting, the word forgive most of the time where it's used in the New Testament, the Greek word, um, the word uh, means um, afime. I, I have no idea whether I'm pronouncing that correctly. Please forgive me if I'm not. If you're a Greek scholar, please have grace. Uh, don't be angry with me. Um, but it means to send or to go, to, to release or to send forth. So basically forgiveness is me Continuing holding this thing against Willem, saying, Willem, you can go and take a seat. You can go forth. And that's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is stopping to hold it against someone and saying, you can go. I release you. I'm not going to keep it against you. Now, forgiveness is not stupidity. Okay? Someone steals from you, don't forgive and say, okay, because I forgave you, I'll open up my eyes. You can come in while I'm not there or closing my eyes. <laughs> Forgiveness is not stupidity. If someone does something against you, you can forgive them, but be wise in that. Okay, does that make sense? So I'm not, I'm not giving free license and saying you've got to forgive and you've got to continue in a relationship that's bad for you or... Uh, You've got to give someone at work another chance. It doesn't necessarily mean that, but it says, I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm not going to allow that to control me. One of the, um, I I had a five-minute to ten-minute interaction with Al yesterday morning. Um, He he, he walked the streets in our vicinity just handing out uh, flyers in in post boxes um, for 512 City Church. Thank you, Al. Appreciate that. and um, I, just before he did that, I, 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 I spoke with him, and, and I was just speaking about what I'm speaking about this morning, and uh, he reminded me of this scripture, and this was in my very first sort of brainstorming about this sermon. This scripture was in there, but I, I sort of threw it out because there's too much. You know, if you prepare for a sermon, you've got 40 scriptures, and you, you, can, you can end up using three or four or five, you know, so it was, it was there, but I threw it out, and just after Al spoke about it, I thought, huh. Let me just revisit that. You know, maybe, maybe I'll see. Maybe it makes it again. And it is a scary scripture, okay? So um, it's a parable that Jesus tells, and he tells about a king that is owed money by a certain rich man. And this man goes, and he doesn't have the ability to pay, and he goes to the king, and he says, please forgive me. Please, 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 just give me a chance to pay it back. And the king takes mercy on him, and he writes off all his debt. And then that exact same man walks out of the king's courts, just probably into the street, and there's a guy that owes him a few dollars probably, and, 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 he's, and he takes him and he shakes him and he says, where's my money? And um, the guy says, I don't, know, I, don't, I don't have it. Please just give me a time. And he says, no way. I'm throwing you in jail and you will pay me back. You'll stay in jail until everything is paid back. 
Now the story goes that when the king heard that, he brought the man back in and he said, listen, why did you do this? I, gave, I, I, I wrote off all your debt and now you go around and you don't show that same kindness and mercy to, to the guy um, on, on the street. And then in Matthew 6, verse 14 to 16, this is sort of at the end of this parable that Jesus tells. It says, Jesus says, he says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. That right there is a scary scripture. Okay? Now, in, in, in my own theology and the way that I look at the Word and the way that I, that I experience God, I, I think God's grace and love is bigger even than my unforgiveness. And I hold on to that. Otherwise, that scripture is really scary. But at the very least, we've got to say that unforgiveness is a big deal to God. Would you agree with that? And we need to learn how to forgive. We need to learn how to let people go and not keep everything against them. Forgive. Don't give the devil a foothold in your heart. Everyone still okay? Ready to move on to the third enemy? About 1200 before Christ, there was a guy, high priest of Israel, his name was Eli. Um, and uh, maybe you know uh, of, their story, of his story, but he had two, two sons. And these sons were extremely wicked. They were, they were just bad, bad people. Um, Ophni and Phineas was their, was their names. Um, and uh, what they did is, um, obviously their dad was the high priest, and at that stage it was before the first king. Um, so uh, God led through the high priest. Priest. So Eli, their dad, was essentially the leader of Israel. And um, so here they are, they're people of profile. Their dad is the, you know, the, 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 the head guy in Israel. And they're probably living a fairly good life, but still they are needy about certain things. So what they end up doing is they, 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 people come with offerings to the, to the tent of the tabernacle, meat offerings that they, that they plan to offer to God, and they go and they say, well, that offering that you're bringing, um, that piece of meat, I want the best cut. Cut off that, that nice, you know, filet, I want that. Take that, give it to me, then you can go and offer the rest to God. So they steal from the people, they steal from God. Um, furthermore, they just sleep around with the, with the ladies that, that, um, uh, that tend the, the tent of the tabernacle. Um, they're extremely evil and wicked. And yet, they had access probably to everything that they needed or wanted because of the high profile of their family, of their dad. You see, the thing is with them that, that, that got them was this enemy called greed. They wanted more. And even though they had, it wasn't enough. They wanted more. And this enemy thrives on the feeling that says, I owe me. <laughs> you get that? I'm going to take. I, I want more? I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll make sure that I have more. And oftentimes this, this, this is sort of built on a desire for money or possessions or even position um, or approval, and we take it by our own means. So either you might work extremely hard because you want more, and you neglect everything else, and you just work so hard because you want more. Um, it might mean that, that you manipulate certain things, or that you scheme or make sort of weird plans. It might be that you're bargaining with God, or in extreme case, cases, like with Hophni and with Phineas, you might just take what is not yours. This enemy of greed. When I started in ministry, um, this is, I don't know, 2003, 2004. How long ago is that? 16 years, 17 years ago, around about there. Um, I, I studied accounting, finished my degree, um, and I was going to be a financial auditor, which, as you probably similar in the stage, which is a, it's, a, it's a good paying position. So um, when I got called by God and I got this 
urge and unction by the Lord and the Spirit that I should step into full-time ministry, I gave up financial accounting and, um, and auditing, and I said no, probably to a comfortable life financially. Make sense to you? Um, and at that stage, I was completely okay with it. I said, I'm good with that. The call of God is more important. The love I have for God and for His people and for His church is more important than, than money would ever be. And I was okay with that initially. And then as time went on, I found myself working in church and being the first one there on a Sunday morning, being the last one to leave after the services, in the weeks laboring for God, weird work hours because, you know, people in church are available oftentimes just at weird hours, um, having to work over holidays when everyone else is having holiday, you've got to make sure that, you know, church keeps going. And I found myself slowly but surely just becoming more disillusioned with where I was at. And then I saw what one of my fellow ministers earned financially. And I'm like, oh no, that is not going to fly. There is no way. And I, I was upset and I, I realized in that moment, greed started to just crawl into my life. And I think it's similar if you ever read the story about Martha and Mary. Um, Mary had the, uh, uh, Martha had the similar thing. She was working and, and serving and doing things. And then she's like, well, what? I want more of Jesus. Why? why? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it. And there was something of this greed that crept into my heart. And what I did after negotiating with myself and bargaining with God is I stopped giving to God. And I rational, I, I had a complete, you know, conversation with God about why this was okay because I was working for the church anyway, so I didn't have to give, you know, to God. My time was already an offering. And essentially, by stopping to give to God, I was giving 10% of my income. I, I just there in a moment, I gave myself a raise of 10%. And I thought it was okay. And for several months, I gave nothing. I, I allowed greed to just take hold of my life. And for you, it might be a completely different way. It might be another context. But oftentimes, we find ourselves living like this with our hands closed and saying, it's mine, <laughs> precious, my precious. You know, uh, it's mine. <laughs> And you know what the remedy is for that? Giving. Giving is the remedy for that. Listen to this. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10 says, Whoever loves money, uh, whoever, whoever loves money never has enough. <laughs> whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. The way to break this foothold is to give. It is to give. Now, that did it for me. Um, I started to give again, um, eventually, after a few months. And it was difficult. Um, but I want to tell you, when you give, it's difficult to be greedy. It's difficult for your heart to, you know, to grab hold. And I'm not saying this to sort of coerce you into you need to give the church money. That's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to address an issue that might be in your heart, um, like it was in mine, and I still have to check it every now and then to make sure. But to live a life where everything is not for me and for myself, but to live a life where we say, God, I'm going to live for you. I'm going to give. I'm going to give to other people. And I remember at that stage, I was so strongly convicted about, about changing my behavior around and starting to give um, that I wanted to give more. So, so I started tithing again, but I, I wanted to give more, and I didn't have any money to give at that stage more than, you know, just a monthly tithe. Um, and the biggest possession that I owned that didn't belong to the bank was my mountain bike. Uh, it was about a half a month's salary, you know, just the value of my mountain bike. And I'm like, well, I'm going to try to break this enemy completely. And I took my mountain bike and I gave it to someone that was getting into mountain biking and it was um, that moment of just giving it away. It was difficult, you know, because it's 
something of worth that I value. And that moment of just giving it away, there was such a, <sighs> such a massive release. And I could feel that enemy of greed that had a grip on my heart. Thy chocha, that chocha that got, that got me. I could feel it scatter away out of my life in that moment. Now, uh, there's a character that lived alongside Hophni and Phinehas. Um, and he was called Samuel. In fact, he was a young guy, a few years younger than Hophni and, Sally, uh, and Phinehas. And he grew up in Eli's house. So he was right there with Eli's sons. He grew up in exactly the same circumstances, probably having less because he was not their actual sons. If ever there was someone that could be greedy and look at what they have and say, oh, I also want some of that, it would have been Samuel. But it was not like that for Samuel, not at all. In fact, his whole life is a testimony of living a life that is given. In fact, the way that he got into that situation was his mother made a promise to God and said, God, if you would help me to bear a son, I will give him to you. And Samuel, his whole existence is a gift. And you can go and read his story the rest of his life. Everything is about living for others, giving to others, giving his time towards others. And even um, if you look at where he stayed, he never stayed in the grand places. He lived in small little towns, um, and he lived in tents. He lived a life that was giving, not about himself. He wasn't tight-fisted. He lived open-handed. Give. Now, the final enemy that I want to speak about this morning, uh, Samuel, whom I just mentioned, anointed Saul as king, but he also anointed David as king later. So there's these two massive leaders in Israel, Saul and David, and both are anointed to be king. And if you read their story, you see there's some tension between them. Uh, 1 Samuel 18, verse 7 to 9, um, it says, This was their song. So this is after David and Saul came back from war. And the people start singing, and they sing, Saul has killed his thousands, and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They created David with ten thousands, and me only with thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. And that is the last enemy that I want to address this morning, is jealousy. Sometimes jealousy takes hold of our hearts. And this enemy thrives on the feeling, after you look at others, you, you're discontent with what you have, and you say, God, you owe me. You owe me. And it thrives on that, on that feeling and that life that when we look at other people. Now, I want to I quickly tell a, a little story just out of my own life again. And uh, some of you might know this, but a, a few years back, my son, Malan, passed away. And you can imagine that that was just an intense, difficult situation that God needed to come and speak into and bring a lot of healing and I'm so grateful for the healing that he has done. And there's probably some more healing to come with regards to that. But in that moment, after the initial shock was gone, I found myself looking at other people's lives and saying, God, why? Why, why do they have it so seemingly easy? You know, and then being a, a pastor... You have all the people in the congregation coming to you and like, look at my new baby, you know, and I'm like, I'm sitting there and I'm smiling with them, but on the inside I'm thinking, ah, man, why God? You owe me. God, you owe me. And that feeling got me for so long. And even to this day, and please bring your baby, show them to me. I want to see them, Okay. <laughs> But to this day, I've got to check my heart. The issue is not with your baby. Your baby is lovely. The issue is I need to check my heart, okay? So are there four pregnancies in the congregation? Five. Okay, I'm behind. Okay. Uh, 
Apparently, there's a fifth one. I didn't know about it. I'll speak to someone after this and find out. But please bring them to me. I want to celebrate and I want to, I want to see them. We want to celebrate them this, in this congregation and pray over them and see them walk in God's ways. The issue is not with, with people having kids. The issue is in my heart and me feeling a certain way towards God. And that change came for me when I started to be thankful for what God did give to me. And that's the, the remedy. We need to thank Him. Now, it was difficult at first because I felt I had nothing to be thankful about. So I started with the basics. Lord, thank you for the roof over my head. Thank you for food on the table. That was about it. Later, as I got back into a habit of thanking God, I started to see the people that, the, that, he's, that He placed in my life, despite difficult situations, that was there supporting me. Um, I started to realize that His love for me was unchanged. And I want to tell you, I came to the real, realization. Um, now, this is a short answer for a very complex question. Why does God make bad things happen to good people? Um, and I realized that if God never does anything again for me in my life, what He did through His Son, Jesus Christ, is enough to thank Him for all eternity. For all eternity. Now, David, the other guy in this weird relationship for the kingship, he had an opportunity to actually kill Saul. And I can imagine David could have been faced with this enemy of jealousy because he wasn't king. Saul was. Saul lived a great life in a palace, and he was sort of banished to the wilderness with Saul trying to kill him. I can imagine he was jealous. And he had an opportunity to kill Saul, and he didn't. He cut off the corner of his robe, and when Saul was a long way off, he kept up this corner and said, Saul, check, check your robe, check the corner. I could have killed you, but I didn't. And li listen to David as he writes in Psalm 183. And um, he says, Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my en enemies. He says later, Don't abandon me, for you made me. This doesn't seem like a man, when he writes this, that he's in a great spot. It seems like he's oppressed from different sides, and David is going through a rough time, okay? But look what he, within this context, in this psalm, look what he, what he writes. He says, um, I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart. I will sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. It's beautiful. David had the ability to thank God in the midst of situations where other people would be discontent and jealous if they compared that to other people. It's beautiful. So, that is the four enemies of our heart. Guilt, anger, greed, and jealousy. Now, there's two big issues with them. The first issue is they hide. <laughs> okay? Oftentimes, we're not aware of them in our lives. It's like bad breath. Okay, you're usually the last person to know that you struggle with bad breath. And oftentimes when we have some of these enemies that's gripping our heart, we're the last person to actually know about them. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things. Your heart deceives you. There's stuff probably in there that you don't know about. There's probably stuff in here that I don't know about. And the second reason why it's an issue is they creep, okay? They sort of slowly but surely come closer and closer. We've got a little boy, me and he's on. Um, his name is Benji. He's a French bulldog, okay? And uh, he's, he's really cute. Um, but he's not allowed to sleep with us in our room. So we've got his little bed just outside the door of our room. We do allow him in the room every now and then, you know, so sometimes, you know, he sits there, but when it's time to sleep, you know, he's got to go out. Um, but what he does is he lies sort of on the edge of where our rooms, you know, the door. He lies there. And then five minutes later when you check, he's just creeped a little bit forward. And then when you tell him Benji, he looks away. I don't know what you're speaking of. Okay? And sometimes if you don't, if you don't give attention to that, the next thing you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and Benji is right here. <laughs> Okay? It's like that with the enemies of our heart. Sometimes they creep 
up on you, slowly but surely gaining more of your heart. Willem, can you quickly just join me on stage? I'd appreciate that. Now this morning, I, I pray for two things. The first thing that I pray for is that God would come and show you your heart. And I want to ask you for a moment before, I'm almost done, there's probably about two, three minutes left. Just, I want to ask you just to close your eyes and just for a moment consider what's going on in your heart and allow the Holy Spirit to come and speak to you about that. Lord, I want to trust that you would come and speak to us about what's going on in our hearts. I pray that you will come and show us the chokas that's there. The issues, whether it's it's being angry with ourselves or with other people, or being selfish and greedy, or whether there might be some resentment towards you. I pray that you will come and show us, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that in your word, you gave us remedies for these issues, God. You didn't just leave us without a way to address it. And I pray, Lord, that you would come and help us, Lord, to confess and to live in freedom. I pray that you will come and help us, Lord, to forgive. I pray, God, that you would come and help us to give to live not so tight-fisted, but to give. And I want to pray, Lord, that you would help us to thank you for what you've given us. I thank you, God. We thank you. And I pray, Lord, that we would build these remedies into our lives. Like a doctor that sees a patient that's struggling with his heart, he might prescribe exercise and diet and living living in an environment that's not with so much stress. And that environment, Lord, we know will change that person's life and his heart. And similarly, God, I pray, Lord, that we would listen to the prescription of the great physician, you, God, and that we will build these habits into our lives. I pray for that in the name of Jesus. May we listen and heed the words of Solomon. May we guard our hearts. May we guard our hearts, God. And where we are lacking to address this, God, I pray that you will come and help us. (laughs) With your great, mighty, strong, but also caring and loving and kind and intimate hand, that you would come and help us, God. Pray that in the name of Jesus.